Hello and welcome to yet another exciting episode of the new Discourses podcast. I'm James Lindsay, and we are talking about critical education theory, or more formally, critical pedagogy. So this will be the second podcast in the formal series that might be quite long. We'll see how this goes. Uh, I'm doing dedicated to critical education theory or critical pedagogy, which is what's at the heart of our schools. As a matter of fact, what we're really focusing on is what's called the critical turn in education. And so uh, in the previous episode of this series, I read through the series editor's introduction and foreword to a book by that title, The Critical Turn in Education by Isaac Gotsman, that I'm going to use as kind of a backbone to lay this out. In this episode, I'm going to read through the author's introduction to the book. So um, my goal is not to just read you a bunch of education books in the podcast, but I do want to read these two introductions uh, because A, the series editors, which I read in the last episode in this series, uh, a couple episodes ago here on the podcast, really gives you a picture of what the thought process uh, is within both Marxism in general as it's evolved over the last 100, 120 years, and in terms of how that's getting applied to education, or in other words, critical pedagogy, critical Marxism coming into education theory. So just for those of you that are kind of new to this, again, pedagogy means theory of education, and critical pedagogy is the actual name for what resulted from the so-called critical turn in education in this book documents very effectively how education was turned from something like a classically liberal education before, let's just throw down a date of around 1970 in North America, to the uh, communist shit show that it has become today. And so just to remind you, um, without much further ado, we are reading through The Critical Turn in Education, which has the subtitle that tells you what this critical turn looked like in three stages from Marxist critique to post-structuralist feminism to critical theories of race. And so Isaac Gotsman, who is a education theorist at Iowa, or at least he was when he wrote this book in, what is it, 2016 or thereabouts, 15, 16, 16, uh, checking real quick, uh, says that education went from its classically liberal roots in the United States through a critical turn, and that occurred in three stages. Education was first critiqued, or education theory, which affected schools of college, colleges of education and schools of education, so teacher pre-service, I should say pre-service teacher education programs in colleges and universities primarily, were first subjected to Marxist critiques of education, and those are going to be... Um, People like Bowles and Gintis, but most notably Paulo Ferreri, uh, maybe Michael Apple falls into that, who wrote the series introduction that we covered in the last podcast. Then later, um, getting into the 80s and probably 90s, we have post-structuralist feminism. In other words, the way that the postmodern, or sorry, the way that the feminists picked up postmodern theory and garbled it into their own goofy agenda through the 80s and 90s. And then that was heavily applied. And meanwhile, you have this lurking um, kind of this sleeper movement coming up called uh, black feminism that was tapped deeply into the post-structuralist feminism movement, but also into the racial liberation movement, uh, the which is race communism. And um, this led to the third stage being that critical theories of race by the late 90s from 95 when maybe Gloria Ladson Billings and William Tate the fourth uh, published toward a critical race theory of education um, the kind of seminal piece on the subject also 1994 is when Bell Hooks published teaching to transgress she was m less specifically a critical race theorist and more specifically a black feminist but we see that education was twisted through three turns of the ratchet of the Marxist leftist ratchet um, since the, uh, we'll use again the bookmark date, 1970, uh, first by being subjected to Marxist critique, then to postmodern garbled feminism, then to critical race theory. And this book lays that out. So we're going to kind of go through this book again for the series, just to reintroduce the series. We're going to go through, I want to go through this book chapter by chapter, but what I want to do is kind of, sum, other than reading these two introductions, I want to summarize the chapters and then actually dip into the actual books 
and papers that the that this book talks about and kind of really give you a picture of what's happened in education. As for this introduction, the author's introduction, Isaac Gotsman being the author, to this book, um, I think it's noteworthy. I think it lays out the entire story. I think it tells you more about how we got where we are today from the end of the 1960s till now. We know generally that the Marxists and leftists of the new left transitioned somehow into academia. We know that they were interested in following Gramsci's instruction to take over education as one of the main cultural pillars. Uh, you know, the so-called long march to the institutions became explicitly their strategy in the 60s following the way that Rudy Deutschke looked at what Mao did. And as we've read before, Mao did what Gramsci thought. And so we have this kind of new cultural revolution based Marxism that relies on student revolution or revolts, student movements. Um, and then the idea of creeping into the colleges and universities and education system in order to create those student movements becomes a strategic maneuver. So you have, you know, the radicals of the 60s, the new left, the weather underground, and so on. Um, them all going into K-12 through education, a lot of the radicals going into K-12 through education and in teacher colleges. And what you see in this introduction is the best roadmap that I know of that shows how we went from pre-1960s radicalism to through the 1960s radicalism and then from there to today where we have a completely um, Marxist redesigned education program that is trying to reproduce a cultural revolution uh, very much like what Mao did with very similar techniques both inside and outside of schools uh, in the United States, Canada, and throughout the West. Just to kind of summarize everything, I sent this book actually to our mutual friend, uh, Benjamin Boyce, if you know who he is, after my last appearance on the Boyce of Reason podcast, and said you should read this introduction. And he sent me a message back just to kind of vindicate my claim. Wow, that really does tell you everything. <laughs> so this is what we're going to read through today. We're going to understand how the critical turn in education was foisted upon our respective nations and what it implies. So without further ado, let's go ahead and read the author's introduction to the critical turn in education which is, again, that 2016 book documenting how critical theory took over education, created critical pedagogy, and led to its dominance in our educational systems throughout the West. So this is, by the way, again, in other words, the monster that we have to fight to, to take back education, take back the schools, protect and save our kids. And if you've listened to the Groomer Schools series that I've done, which should now be in three episodes, uh, or something like that, or two or three episodes. There will be three soon, if not three, depending on what order I release things in. Um, you will uh, see kind of the end point of what this looks like and how catastrophic and damaging and dangerous it is. On the other hand, um, if you look at this side of it, uh, you know, you see that this has a long, long running trajectory behind it. Uh, and it didn't just crop up out of nowhere. It's not just some weird failure that, that happened in education in the last few years that things just fell apart. No, this is a purposed move to undermine North American education systems, in particular U.S. education systems, that has been very successful and must be rebuffed as quickly as possible. I mean, they've taken 50 years to take it over. We need to get it back within a few years, uh, which will require tremendous work, tremendous discernment, tremendous understanding, tremendous willingness to stand up and fight and to push and to fire people and to take their positions and to do some serious house cleaning and then to lay down some legislation and to enforce that legislation and to completely rethink what we're doing with organizations like the National Education Association, the NEA or the AFT, American Federation of Teachers, or the Department of Education itself or the Department of Education at the state levels. Those all need to be rethought desperately because they've all been colonized and co-opted. And so there was some further ado. Now we're without the ado. So introduction to the question, where did all the 60s radicals go? The most Accurate answer, noted Paul Boole, 1991, in his classic Marxism in the United States, would be neither to religious cults nor yuppiedom, but to the classroom. Where did all the 60s radicals go? To the classroom. That's the end of the quote. After the fall of the new left arose a new left. An academic left. So the, I know it's a little confusing to read that out loud. The new, the first new left is capitalized. The second new left is not capitalized. 
So I'll read it again. After the fall of the proper noun new left arose a new left, a proper noun academic left. For many of these young scholars, Marxist thought, and particularly what some refer to as Western Marxism or Neo-Marxism, and what I will refer to as the critical Marxism tradition, was an intellectual anchor. As participants in the radical politics of the 60s entered graduate school and moved into faculty positions and started publishing, the critical turn began to change scholarship throughout the humanities and social sciences. The field of education was no exception. So there's a lot we can actually touch on right there. First of all, he's looking historically at the radicalism of the 1960s. Those are your 60s radicals. They form this thing that's been referred to as the new left that is most famously, uh, it is all the 60s left radicalism, but it's most famously known for opposing the Vietnam War. Um, so it was not, it was breaking from the old Marxist left and taking up a new tradition, which turned out to be liberation, which we find described by Herbert Marcuse, who is often called the father of the new left. But the new left didn't last very long. 68 to 72 or thereabouts, and it more or less wasn't very popular. It was blowing stuff up, maybe 64 to 78, 72 or something like that. It was blowing stuff up. It was doing violence. It was causing mayhem, riots, etc. kind of like today. Nobody likes that. Turns out nobody likes that. And these uh, radicals realized at some point that they weren't going to get their revolution the way that they wanted. In 72, um, Marcuse writes this kind of flailing book called Counter Revolution and Revolt, where he gets all pissed off about um, everything that went down uh, and how they are not going to get their glorious liberation in 1969 or 70 or 71 and blames society. And he gets actually quite naked with his the, the Marxism and his ideology and the radical uh, destructive nature of his ideology if you read through Counter-Revolution and Revolt, 72. So that's the fall of the new left. And Gottsman here tells us that after the fall of the new left arose something different, an academic left. In other words, it went into the colleges and universities. And then it's based in, he says, Marxist thought took as an anchor Western Marxism or Neo-Marxism, but he wants to not call it either of those things. He wants to call it critical Marxism. Critical theory equals critical Marxism. So if there is any dispute left for anybody that critical theory is Marxism, let that be dispelled. He calls it the critical Marxist tradition. And we'll hear why in a moment. And so he said that the radicals of the 60s who didn't want to go to war in Vietnam, for example, but also who realized the value of becoming so-called organic intellectuals as Mark had it, Marx had it, or working class intellectuals or the vanguard or whatever that, that Gramsci was describing, um, they entered graduate schools large and faculty positions, and they did so largely in humanities, social sciences, and education. And he says, this critical turn began to change scholarship throughout those fields. Very important to pay attention. So this is him laying out how everything started. This is, again, right there, like 70, 72, 73, when this was really happening. And again, just to remind you that uh, in 73, you know, the NEA, well, 71 and 72, the NEA commissioned uh, Patricia Bidal of, um, was she at American University at the time? to write a manual about uh, the, the a manual about race and education that that presages all of whiteness studies. Whiteness studies was being funded and brought to um, the forefront in education in 1973 by the National Education Association, by the teachers union. So it was already co-opted by then as well. And remember that's 50 years ago. Uh, 71 was 50 years ago. 71 is when they commissioned that, and then 73 it was published and distributed by them. So we're getting there to 50 years from that. But going back to Gottsman, the turn to critical Marxist thought, notice he's just dispensed, not neo-Marxist, not Western Marxist, critical Marxist. The turn to critical Marxist thought is a defining moment in the past 40 years of educational scholarship, especially for educational scholars who identify as part of the political left. It introduced the ideas and vocabulary. Remember, communists share your uh, vocabulary, but they don't share your dictionary. So they use your words, but they misuse them. It introduced the ideas and vocabulary that continue to frame most conversations in the field, that's of education, about social justice, which is itself one of those words, such as hegemony, ideology, consciousness, praxis, and most importantly, the word critical itself 
which has become an ubiquitous which has become ubiquitous as a descriptor for left educational scholarship. So critical education lies within the vein of the critical Marxist tradition, which is uh, critical theory, which is Gottsman's name. Critical Marxism is then his name for critical theory, which is also neo-Marxism, the, the tool of, of, of it. And he says that all left scholarship in education is tied to the word critical, which he also admits has been redefined by Marxists to mean something different, not critical thinking, but critical theory, something different. Initially, Gottsman tells us, initially sequestered in curriculum studies and sociology of education, which is exactly what I tried to tell everybody before. It starts with the sociology. It's very interested, of course, in anything where it can be administrative, bureaucratic, or uh, whatever. So curriculum studies. Initially sequestered in curriculum studies and sociology of education, today critical scholarship is frequently published in the journals of some of the field's most historically conservative areas, such as educational administration and science education. We saw today math education. I saw I shared a thing on on the social media today. I know today is dated as soon as I say it here because it won't even this won't even come out for a week or two from when I'm saying this. But the New York or sorry the Washington Post um, publishing an article that math education is racist. Right? It's made its way in. Um, even the math education, the most historically conservative areas such as educational administration and science education, the critical turn Gottsman tells us radicalized the field of education, of course. Since its beginnings in the 1970s and 1980s, critical educational scholarship has also pushed far beyond the Marxist tradition and its focus on political economy and social class. Although the critical Marxist tradition remains a foundation for much of the work that followed, critical education scholars now engage a range of intellectual and political traditions that help us better understand culture and identity, gender and sexuality, race and ethnicity, constructions of ability, ecological crises, and their myriad intersections. So you can see the whole leftist pot is mixed together into this critical education theory um, stew or whatever we want to say. I guess it's all mixed together in the pot of critical education theory. And you have everything for ecological, race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, culture, identity, constructions of ability. So that's going to be like Michael Oliver's uh, Social Model of Disability, which was from 1980, working its way in. We can remember also where it says it put, he says we pushed beyond, uh, the, the, Mar the, the Marxist education theorists pushed beyond traditional Marxism, right? It says it pushed well beyond that, that far beyond the Marxist tradition. If you remember, we talked when we did the first in this series with Michael Apple's introduction that he talked about there was the, the politics of redistribution, which they're equating with um, mar vulgar old school Marxism and then the politics of recognition, which is this new pushing beyond. But that's just the redistribution of privilege rather than the redistribution of economics. Marx's belief was that all privilege flowed from economic status and basically everything actually flowed from economic and material status uh, as the basic um, variable that, that everything could be boiled down to. And these so-called Critical Marxists believe they know better and are smarter, and they have all these different cultural elements and identity-based elements that have been worked into it. Culture and identity, gender and sexuality, race and ethnicity, constructions of ability, ecological crises, and their myriad intersections. And so they've pushed beyond by doing something that they would consider the politics of recognition, which is basically to have incorporated some postmodernism and a lot of identity politics. And to the goal is then to seize and redistribute privilege and cultural capital, not just economic and material capital. That's all that they're saying there. Critical scholarship has also radically altered the way we inquire. Yeah, because it's subbed out critical thinking and replaced it with critical theory, which means that as we've heard from, say, Alison Bailey, it starts from a totally different set of assumptions, where as Alison Bailey puts it in her Privilege Preserving Epistemic Pushback paper, which I've talked about here before many times, um, tracking privilege preserving epistemic pushback and what is it, feminist and critical race philosophy classrooms, Allison Bailey, Hypatia 2017. You can go look it up. I think I got that citation correct uh, off memory. But she says in there that critical thinking tradition is concerned with epistemic adequacy, soundness, validity of arguments, et cetera, evidence, yada, yada. But the critical pedagogy, she specifically names critical education theory. Critical pedagogy is rooted in a different set of assumptions that come from neo Marxism. In other words, 
as Gottsman has it here, critical Marxism, that focus on power relations uh, instead of having things correct. Epistemic adequacy means knowing what you're talking about. Instead, we're going to worry about power dynamics. And so he's just confirming what Bailey said. Actually, he said this a year before Bailey did, but we see it in two different places um, in this regard. And he says, critical scholarship, just to reread that sentence, has also radically altered the way we inquire from the way we conceptualize our research to the way we gather and interpret evidence to support our claims, which means they do so using critical theory as the lens. So if it supports their theory, it's in. And if it doesn't, it must have been contaminated with some kind of uh, privilege or bourgeois values or something and has to be excluded. It was white supremacy hiding his research. Meanwhile, as we saw from Michael Apple in this in, in the other introduction to this book, the foreword of this book, Michael Apple explains that one of the main projects of critical pedagogy is or critical education is to expand what counts as research. To do what? To include critical theory nonsense, whether that's autoethnographies, which are diary entries, auto. So ethnography is a written account of an ethno, ethnic situation, cultural situation, and auto means that you are talking about yourself. It's a diary entry that you draw sociological conclusions from. So we're going to broaden broaden what counts as research to include that, to include piss poor studies like we replicated in the Grievance Studies Affair, where you you, you interview a few handpicked people who think in a particular way and pretend that constitutes a representative sample because of a genuinely representative sample, you know, requiring such a thing that would just reproduce white supremacy and patriarchy because that's reproducing the, the non-critical, um, what is it? The, the dominant culture of research. So you have to broaden what counts as research to have things outside that. And that could include like in a feminist glaciology paper, consulting indigenous mythologies about, you know, bacon fat and its impacts on glaciers, whether or not glaciers have sex with one another, feminist art projects. These are all real examples of what's in that feminist glaciology paper, uh, that, uh, really was <laughs> my big entry point and it getting pissed off and wanting to do something about all of this. So, you know, it radically altered the way we inquire. In other words, it made it self-serving to critical Marxism, which is exactly all they do. They come in, they seize a thing, make it self-serving and exclude eventually everything outside of that. So they're, they're, it's a, it's a colonization movement. They grow, it's like cordyceps mushroom, which is this mushroom that infects like caterpillars or something. And then they go and they do whatever behavior and then they grow into a fungus underground uh, and the fungus grows up and it fruits and then somehow new caterpillars end up getting the spores and then they're turned into mushrooms later too. It colonizes in the same way. Another example of those ants that get the fungus and crawl up to the end of the blade of grass and they get eaten by a sheep or something in there. Or it's a different parasite. But these kind of mind control zombification parasites and fungi, uh, it works like that. It gets inside of a thing and it changes it from within to be completely self-serving. And then once it's there, it excludes everything else. Like that caterpillar is no longer there when the fungus is done with it, uh, the cordyceps fungus. And so the cordycepsing is what's going on. And this is a fundamentally parasitic enterprise. And this is what critical Marxism does is this fundamentally parasitic enterprise. Um, so critical scholarship has also radically altered the way we inquire from the way we conceptualize our research to the way we gather and interpret evidence to support our claims is a very pleasant way to describe that they're engaging in grotesque, self-serving, uh, ideological capture of institutions and, and, and knowledge producing and disseminating processes like research and education, uh, for their own purposes, a really nice way to say it. And so then he goes on almost when you understand it, just it's hard not to laugh to say the critical turn has contributed greatly to educational scholarship. This is something to celebrate. So critical Marxists going to critical Marxist. It's always the same with these people. However, he says, while celebratory of the critical turn and the scholarship and the conversations it has fostered in the field, this book is written from a standpoint of concern. Of course it is. They're always concerned because they're not getting all of their way right now. Much of critical scholarship, he says, is insightful, but ubiquity has come with a price. Ubiquity, of course, means that it's everywhere. Uh, it's now worked its way into everything in education. He says, our theoretical tools are not always sharp. They're often dulled by thin readings of ideas, a failure to consider tensions between theories, and an overzealousness to be all things to all people. So what they have is a false theory, a bunch of garbage and it doesn't work. And so then they can blame and say, oh, it was the, the people who wasn't, weren't that good at it, creating the theory. 
And the theory, the problem with theory here in general, well, how do you get so much thin theory, et cetera, that doesn't do in the tension of the tension means the contradictions, which means it's, it's the epicycles of bullshit is what it really is. But how do you end up with this? Because theory doesn't have to be accountable to reality. They don't have to bounce their ideas off reality. And then when they do, they can say, oh, well, the theory was just thin. They didn't consider the depth of the tensions. And this has been Marxism had this. Uh, and if you read the, the critical theorists like Horkheimer, very early on in the 30s, or even, you know, Gramsci and Lukács from the 20s and the 10s, 1920s and 10s. You hear them just ripping on Marx. They didn't, he didn't understand that freedom and justice are dialectical concepts. He thought that you could, uh, you know, agitate the working class to a spontaneous revolution, but instead you end up stabilizing them as they start to get some reforms that they wanted and they become a counter revolutionary force. So it isn't going to work. Marx was wrong. Marx was wrong. He didn't consider the tension between freedom and justice. He didn't consider uh, his theory was too thin to properly understand the role of uh, stabilization forces when when Marxists start to agitate for reforms, etc. Um, and an overzealousness to be all things to all people. So these are the things that they criticize too often. He says our scholarship is sloppy. Yeah, no shit. Uh, <laughs> tell me about it, Isaac. Um, too often our scholarship is sloppy. We too frequently reference texts that don't support our claims, rarely go back to our original sources for ideas, and don't spend enough time carefully constructing our arguments and situating them within specific scholarly or activist conversations. And too often we resort to sloganeering and posturing. It's because it's activist first, Isaac. And maybe if you didn't want to have this problem with carefully constructing, you know, or sorry, we, we sloppy, don't reference right, go back, don't go back to the original sources, don't spend time carefully constructing right. Maybe you shouldn't have tried to broaden the scope of what education and research are about. Maybe broadening the scope of research was your mistake. But anyway, I digress. These problems, he tells us, have led to a crisis of clarity. As Gloria Ladson, Ladson I always say her name wrong, Gloria Ladson Billings, 2014, recently noted, quote, the word critical, and that's itself in quotes, has become so much a part of the English lexicon that its academic meaning has begun to lose currency. All right, so let's pause and laugh for a moment, because what's actually happening is they've double, they've double purposed a word to colonize it from within like a cordyceps. And as a result, People are confused between the two meanings, and the two meanings have been used in different contexts by different people in different ways without being formally academic, which is the academic left, which is to say they weren't being truly Marxist with what they were doing anymore. And so it has begun to lose currency, she warns. That's the end of the quote. Gottsman again, it is it is uh, too often unclear what we mean when we call our scholarship critical, and this lack of clarity has come at a cost. We seem to rarely understand what we are trying to communicate with one another, much less what we are trying to communicate to the outside world. That's because it's all bullshit, but nevertheless. Critical scholarship, he says, may not be in a state of crisis, but it is in a state of dilution and fragmentation, because real communism will never be tried. Our critical conversation lacks a sense of wholeness, of unity, of solidarity. Critical education studies too often feels like a blur of articles, books, names, and words. Is there something central, something core? If the name of the game is to publish, we are fine, but if the name of the game is radical social change, we are in trouble. So what he's saying from his position of concern is that, and it's the same thing we saw in the other introduction, the Michael Apple's introduction to the series, he says or to the book, I'm sorry, from, from the context of the broader series, is that the they're not making academia political, they're making the political academic. And that means it's becoming in opposition to what uh, the perpetual revolution goals of the critical Marxists. And so, you know, he's saying this is just becoming a thing that we're doing for its own sake. And if that's if our goal is just to publish papers and put books and things, that's great. We have our careers, et cetera. But if we're really going to change society, we're in big trouble. Uh, so what this is, is that call back to action to 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 the call back to the catechism uh, of the critical faith and to really, you know, twist people, dial people back into their, their, um, their religious commitment to constantly be political radicals ahead of all things, which is completely inappropriate in research and education anyway, which of course they don't believe that they think it's core to the project because as Marx indicated, and they repeat in basically all of these books at some way or another, the point is not to study society to understand it, but to change it. Um, so 
carrying on with Gotsman, I am certain this book succumbs to many of the failings that I decry. I am not lobbying for perfection, nor am I claiming to be immune. I am part of the we. little self-deprecation to get everybody uh, on board so they don't feel so called out. My intention is simply to push and in doing so contribute to a conversation that will help critical scholars develop nuanced and sophisticated social theory and engage in a more strategic political advocacy. It is no exaggeration to say the world is on fire. So the climate change stuff, right? Definitely getting baked into this here. But um, what are they talking about? Develop a nuanced and sophisticated social theory. In other words, it's to keep trying to, their, their theory keeps failing in reality. So they have to keep changing theory until it's supposed to match reality. I think it was in that last episode of this series that I talked about what epicycles are and how the geocentric model versus the heliocentric model. When you have a bad starting place for your assumption, you have to just keep adding articles and pieces and junk to your theory to get it closer and closer. And I even said that, you know, uh, for your transform tells you that if it's a math thing, but if you did that enough times, if they really were epicycles, you could actually get to the thing exactly, but through the most clunky, ridiculous manner possible. Um, a much more elegant explanation exists, and it begins, not to say that we necessarily have it, but we, it begins by rejecting critical Marxism and Marxism in general. Critical Marxism is already just an epicycle-filled Marxist theory. Marxism was wrong in the first place, so they added epicycles to create critical uh, cultural Marxism and then more epicycles to create what we would call in this book critical Marxism or neo-Marxism or critical theory, then more epicycles to create identity Marxism, and now more epicycles to create woke, which is cultural identity Marxism. It's just adding more and more sophistication and nuance to something that doesn't work in the first place because it's just wrong. And they're starting with the theory rather than starting with the observations of reality and just being wrong about it. And Marx's whole thing is being upside down about that. He believed he was actually giving a scientific, well, if we take Marx at his word, he claimed to be believing that he was starting from a truly scientific study of history that was going to understand history's forces, history being the engagement of human beings and their behavior to articulate a model of how we were going to end up ending history by getting to the utopia. The whole thing's just wrong. That's the problem. Uh, so he says, it's no exaggeration to say the world is on fire. Climate change. Oh no. Ego must be put aside and humility embraced. So humble yourself before the program, get on board with more critical, your, your, your critical theory isn't critical enough, make it more critical. What is it that they used to say about conservatives? Uh, is conservatism can't fail, people just fail conservatism. Well, here it is, critical theory can't fail, but people just fail critical theory. Um, it is, uh, we must ask ourselves difficult questions such as how we situate our critical education projects within the broader radical struggle to squelch the inferno of the world being on fire. Of course, we must ask ourselves, ourselves, if our social analysis is robust enough, can it see the world outside of schooling? We must ask ourselves if our political advocacy is strategic enough. Are we acting in concert with other struggles? Do we see the intersections? We must ask ourselves if we are moving forward with the thoughtfulness and analytical care that radical social change requires, and if our inquiry and our advocacy, our scholarly publishing, and our on-the-ground activism is helping us realize the world of our radical imaginations. You can hear the crack pottery going on here. Our radical imaginations. We're going to realize this world through theory and praxis. And we remember from Marcuse that Marcuse said that the bridge between the is and the ought is laid in theory, which, um, and all of this is just rife through with it. I, I could read this from the Marxist uh, encyclopedia if I remember which entry it was uh, in their, their Marxism, but the, the theory and practice can't be separated. Let me see if I can actually find this. Practice and theory from Marxist.org glossary. The Marxist.org have this giant encyclopedia of everything. This is the way that Marxists think about theory and practice. The entry is practice and theory. Practice means activity with a means and an end. These words, practice, action, activity, praxis, labor, behavior, are used with different meanings by different writers in different times and different languages. The crucial point is that for Marxists, Practice is inclusive of its mental, theoretical, or ideological aspects. These ideological or mental aspects can be abstracted from practice only relatively. The contrast between theory and practice is always only a conditional and relative one. Practice is active rather than being a passive observation and is directed at changing something. The point is to change society. Practice differs from activity in general because practice is inseparable from theory. 
which gives its me- gives its means an end. So theory knows the end, and it knows the way. And practice has to be; uh, it cannot be separated from that. And practice means being active in order to change the world in accordance with the radical imaginations that Gottsman was talking about. Practice, uh, the Marxist.org encyclopedia tells us, is only enacted through theory, and theory is formulated based on practice. It sounds circular, because it is. Whenever theory and practice are separated, they fall into a distorted one-sidedness. Theory and practice can only develop, can only fully develop in connection with one another. Human activity is always purposeful, but in the earliest stages of development of society, before the development of the division of labor, so that's in your um, Marx's first stage of history, which would be uh, the primordial communism, or primitive communism, or tribal communism. There was no separation between theory and practice. This is a this is a Genesis level religious statement, by the way. Human activity is always purposeful, but in the earliest stages of the development of society, so in the garden before the fall, uh, by uh, which came by the development of division of labor, there was no separation between theory and practice. Man and God were not sundered. With the development of the division of labor, so theory being the, if we go back to Hegel, that's the idea, and then practice being the activities of people in service to the idea, and everything was perfect and harmonious before the fall, which came with the division of labor, according to Marxism. With the development of the division of labor, they tell us the theoretical side of the development of human activity separated out from the practical aspect of that activity with the supervision of labor Uh, becoming a distinct activity in and of itself. In other words, a managerial class came into existence, which are the people that Marx hated. He had, had, in in kind of common parlance, Marx had had issues with management. Um, The distinction between the object of practice, which is changed, and the means of practice, which is used up, is important in making sense of practice. It should also be noted that one has practice in general and practices, each of which is directed toward a specific end using a a specific means. Those are sometimes called mass lines of action in Marxism. They are activist pushes in a particular direction. So you see a particular strategic goal and you take action along those lines using theory to guide you. In critical race theory, the main mass line of action is to call everything you want to control racist until you control it. Or to say that it's associated with white supremacy or colonized by white supremacists or reproduces white supremacy culture. That's a mass line of action. Practice, they tell us, is the criterion of truth. Think about that for five seconds. In this sense, practice must be understood in its broadest sense, inclusive of the many kinds of mental and material activity which contribute to the changing knowledge and the world, which to con- which contribute to changing knowledge and the world. So it's again that Marx is changing thing. Um, and of course, I didn't. I just glazed over this, but there is a very Hegelian aspect here that we can derive from this exact same page on this on this uh, Marxist.org website where he says the distinction between the object of practice, which is changed, and the means of practice, which is used up, blah, 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 and then the separation of theory and praxis, which we just heard. The the entry immediately before practice and theory in the encyclopedia is practical idea, which is a Hegelian concept. So the ties to Hegelian religion, the dialectical faith that I've laid out before, are perfectly clear. They say here, in Hegel's system, the practical idea is the penultimate stage of development of the idea. The idea is God for Hegel and his religion and his systematic philosophy, which is really systematic theology. The practical idea is the penultimate stage of the development of the idea, meaning God realizing himself. The absolute idea is the unity of the theoretical idea and the practical idea, the perfect re-wedding of theory to practice. In his characteristic upside-down way for Hegel, theory is the criterion of truth. And we just read here that now practice for Marx is the criterion of truth. In the practical idea, cognition, which is knowledge and volition, which is will and intention, are synthesized. The subjective notion is merged with objectivity. Means becomes identical with end. And so means and ends are the same thing. And at the at the end of history for Hegel in his religion, so what you have here then is Marx saying that with the division of labor came the separation of the practical and the theoretical. And at the end of history, when we've achieved the utopia, the practical and the theoretical will will fuse perfectly again and theory will be perfectly in line with practice and everybody will practice theory exactly and according with its dictates and that's why everything will be perfectly harmonious and everything will work out just fine and utopian like and that's why everybody's going to have to have exactly the same idea little diversion for context here that's again that was from gotsman's claiming that 
basically fusing theory and practice helps us realize the world of our radical imaginations. So you hear the utopian nonsense going on here. He then says, I think we can rise to the challenge of these questions. In fact, as I will discuss in the conclusion to this book, I believe many in the field already are. But there is much work to do. If we are going to truly... So this is where Solzhenitsyn warns. He says, you might be getting tired, but I assure you the communist who's destroying your society is not tired. There is much work to do. We're going to keep pushing, keep going. So you have to push and resist twice as hard, even ex as exhausting and frustrating as it is. As much as you want to go back to living your life, they don't want to go back to living a life. They want to conquer your life, and you have to fight harder than they do, and they are not tired. There is much work to do for them, and theory and practice must be wedded. It is a lifelong project in which no one has ever done, according to Robin D'Angelo. A lifelong commitment, in fact, to a practice in which no one has ever done. If we are truly going to push for a feminist, anti-racist, democratic, socialist society— Gottsman says that's his advocacy, one that can forcefully push against the structures and ideologies that support and entrench patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism, I believe we have to address these questions honestly, rigorously, and as a critical educational community. We have to engage in debate, be willing to move out of our respective camps and to shift our perspectives, and to do all of this, I think we have to be clear about our intellectual and political commitments. What are our values and beliefs? Where do they come from? This is not a call for consensus. There are many very real divisions in the critical community, and I do not believe our differences of thought and experience should be rationally deliberated away, rationally is in scare quotes. These differences matter, and we should seek to understand and not erase. However, to the best of our ability, I do believe that we should move toward uh, solidarity. Solidarity, therefore, you can understand as this so-called mechanism of the new sensibility, uh, you can understand that this is going to be um, a synthesis. It's going to be a synthetic cobbling together. It is a fake form of holding together a society. And it means collectivism. Fake form of holding together a society. Solidarity. Uh, synthetic form of holding together society. I believe he says we have to if we're going to struggle against social injustice with any success. I love the arrogance and idiocy of these people. So much progress has been made and they just completely refute it so that they can keep, because they haven't had their Marxist revolution yet, because we don't have a utopia, which is a crackpot idea. So, all right, he turns to another section, historically informed criticism. Tedious. This book does not attempt to define once and for all, for all time, what it means to be critical or what a critical theory is or is not. They refuse to define anything in concrete terms because if they do, they know that it's going to get obliterated. This is an intellectual swindle. This is the kind of stuff why Eric Vogelin, uh, the Catholic philosopher, did call Marx an intellectual swindler and all the people in his, in his tradition afterwards are intellectual swindlers. We're not even going to attempt to define it clearly. We'll be vague. All informal, but you know what we mean, or we mean what we mean when we say what we mean, what we what we mean by it. This is completely bogus. Rather, he says the goal is to enrich dialogue in the critical educational community. This book seeks to do this by offering historically informed criticism, in other words, Marxism. This move to seeing the history of ideas as historically informed criticism, so that could be Hegel or Marx is in methodological agreement with recent work by historians Peter Gordon and uh, Warren Breckman. In an opening essay to an edited book on approaches to European intellectual history, Gordon, in 2014, shapes his approach as a push against contextualism. Quote, Over the past half century, the contextualist imperative has done a great service to intellectual history by deepening its capacities for methodological self-consciousness, but it has also had the unfortunate effect of erecting a barrier against philosophy and political theory alongside other modes of criticism, end quote. Thus, I don't have to interpret this because he's going to do it for me. Thus, Gordon argues that the, quote, barrier be dismantled and that we reimagine intellectual history less as a distinctive discipline and more as the eclectic practice that Warren Breckman in this volume calls a, quote, rendezvous discipline, that is a trading zone amongst the disciplines that could serve as a space for the flourishing of historically informed criticism, blah, blah, blah. In other words, Marxism, 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 Marxism. That's the end of that quote. Conceptualized as such, the role of the intellectual historian, aka Marxist, is not simply to capture and illuminate the context in which ideas are conceived and initially received, 
Rather, the intellectual historian, as a critic participating in the contemporary, must also engage the enduring nature of specific ideas in a way as to allow for reflection on their meaning and significance in the current historical moment. Blah, blah, blah. As a piece of historically informed criticism focused on critical educational scholarship, this book is intended to, one, show how, when, and why critical education idea, critical educational ideas emerged, were taken up, pushed and pulled, and developed in relationship to specific socio-historical contexts. So now we're at the part where he really says what all this means. Okay, so pause. This is what I think this book does really well, by the way, is show how, when, and why critical educational ideas emerged, were taken up, pushed and pulled. So this is the history, this book turns out to tell the history of how our educational system got turned into the Marxist monstrosity that it is now. And I think it's important for us to understand this history. And I think this author does a wonderful job of documenting it. You can see the critical turn on education happening. These are ideas that should never have been taken up in North American, especially United States, uh, US. U.S. educational contexts. They never should have been taken up, and this book shows how that happened, and it does a decent job of it. So one, I think the author, having read this book a couple times now, um, achieves this agenda, and two, he says, in the process, illuminate the enduring nature of critical educational ideas and how reflection on these ideas and the context in which they emerge may offer insight into contemporary educational and social struggles, including our ability as a critical ed- as a critical educational community to develop nuanced, sophisticated, and rigorous critical educational theory. That's a lot of words to say that by looking at the history, they can get new ideas that let them keep pushing forward in the same direction. In particular, he says, I am interested in the role of of intellectual and political traditions in the development of radical ideas, the values and beliefs that scholars bring to the table, and the ways in which scholars have been and continue to be situated within broad conversations about radical thought. So everything in Marxism is considered to be relational, not only to if it's identity Marxism, to your identity category and the power dynamics allegedly working on that. If it's old Marxism, your class status and the power dynamics relevant to that, where you are within the base versus superstructure hierarchy, uh, that relational aspect of, of privilege or advantage or power uh, has to always be there. And so you're constantly trying to figure out how to position yourself relationally within these broader sweeping contexts. So they have to understand who everybody is and what their politics are, because that's what really defines whether their ideas are right or not, is their politics. As political theorist, he says, Stephen Eric Bronner notes, quote, ideas build upon ideas, thinkers upon thinkers, books upon books, tradition defines the terms or mediates the context in which the conversation between thinkers occurs, end quote. Tradition Gottsman tells us, helps us be specific. As we develop our understanding of the sources of our cultural and intellectual values, as well as the tacit assumptions that underlie them, we will be better positioned to advocate skillfully and articulately for our critical educational positions. My focus on what critical education scholar Ken McGrew in 2011 referred to as the origins and iterations of the intellectual and political traditions in critical educational scholarship is thus predicated on the assumption that such a focus on historical understanding will help us lead to political clarity. So for them, again, everything comes back to making sure that their political agenda is going to be put first. And remember, this is This is a program to remake schools in accordance with their Marxian vision of everything in in society, etc. So that's the historical interpretation, in other words, that they're Marxist part of this. The details, he says, this book does not offer a sweeping survey of the landscape of critical educational theory. There is probably a place for such a book, but this is not that book. Rather, I attempt to offer sustained attention to significant ideas, individuals, texts, moments, and debates in the field that I see as core to both the history of the development of critical educational studies as a subfield in education, particularly in the United States, as well as to future scholarship in the field. Like I said, I think this is the book's greatest contribution. The book really brings out the history of how this got incorporated, where it came from, and how it got incorporated into North American and especially United States educational theory, and eventually took it over, took over all of our colleges of education, as we will uh, see, and as you should understand at this point. And if it took took over the College of Education, it takes over 
teach teachers and administrators. And if it takes over teachers and administrators, it takes over schools. And if it takes over schools, it takes over children. And that's why we're in the context we are with our schools now. Critical pedagogy has, at least for 40 years, completely colonized our colleges of education. The first 10 years, 70 to 80, in my kind of cheap uh, historical bookmarking here, laid the groundwork for that to step in. So that would have been mostly Marxist critique of education creeping its way in. And then from 80 going forward, of course, it incorporated these other aspects, post-structural feminism and critical race theory. But at that point, they were off to the races because by the early 1980s, they were already in. The Trojan horse had already been led into education. And so it's a, this book, I think, is very important in exposing how these completely un-American ideas, these ideas antithetical to the entire Western tradition uh, as a set of Western values. I know that communism came out of the Western tradition, but as a set of Western values, how they even came in. And so, again, I applaud the author for telling us the nightmare that he helped create. I seek, he says, to illuminate some of the central questions raised in the first 40 years of critical scholarship and discuss some of the types of conceptual frames that scholars in the field on the political left have adopted in order to understand the relationship between school and society and the role of schooling and the education more and education more broadly in radical social change. I also seek to understand the ways in which these conversations intersected with conversations in other disciplines and fields. And I am thus always interested in how educational scholars are situated within the broader intellectual and political traditions that are not simply academic, but more generally central to radical thought. Um, Each of the chapters should be thought of as a window into the historical conversation about critical educational scholarship, as well as a piece of contemporary analysis. I agree with Gottsman. He does a good job with this. And as we go through, you start to see how everything changed in education to get to where we are today. As such, he says, I encourage reading individual chapters alongside the primary texts at the center of the conversation. For example, read Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed alongside chapter one. Now you see the method behind my madness for this series. That's exactly what I want to do. Uh, Although I'm going to bring in some other information that I understand to contextualize this and make sure you understand what's really happened and what's really happening. He says that you should do this in order to illuminate the historical context in which the ideas emerged and raise questions about how the core ideas and the primary text might be understood and engaged in the current historical moment. That's because old Marxism is always wrong and it always needs to be updated and nuanced, remember. Epicycles and epicycles and epicycles. Continuing, additionally, all, that's in italics, all of the scholars discussed in this book have rich intellectual and political lives that far exceed the small period of time and space that I've allotted. Michael Apple and Henry Giroux, for example. Okay, so these names, by the way, I'm going to kind of highlight, the, you, you need to know these names. I don't know if you need to know Isaac Gottsman. You do need to know Michael Apple and you do need to know Henry Giroux. Another one that you definitely are going to need to know is Paulo Freire, F-R-E-I-R-E, Brazilian. And uh, another one is Joe Kinchelo. Um, you will definitely need to know. Gloria Ladson Billings is yeah another one that you will definitely need to know. So anyway, Michael Apple and Henry Drew, for instance, who are the subjects of chapter chapters three and four, respectively, continue to produce insightful, interesting, and significant work in the field. Remember, Michael Apple is also the series editor of this entire uh, series in which this book is contained, and he was the author of the foreword we wrote for, we read for part one, where he gives away the whole picture of what critical education is really about. That I primarily focus on Apple's work in the 1970s and Giroux's work in the 1980s is a sign of the great significance of this older work and the history of the field and is not a commentary on their worth of their later work. So what he's telling you here, just simply to summarize what that was, because I broke it up, is you know, he's going to talk about, say, Giroux in the context of what he wrote in the 1980s, and he's saying Giroux did a lot of other interesting stuff too. Same for Apple, 70s, but he did a lot of interesting other stuff too. So that's all that's about. In chapter one, and this is this is the roadmap. This is, he's going to go through each chapter piece by piece as an introduction to a book often does, and you're going to hear how the critical turn in education went. In chapter one, I chronicle the history of the reception of Paulo Freire's scholarship in the field of education in the United States. Counter to the dominant narrative, I argue that Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which was published in 1970, did not launch the critical turn. Rather, I contend, 
Freire's work was revisited in the mid-1980s because of it. So the critical turn happened and then brought people back to the pedagogy of the oppressed. As a matter of fact, Henry Giroux, the name we were just discussing, actually did that. Uh, and that story is its own kind of hilarious thing. Fre- Freire, as far as I can tell, is a guru. Uh, you get that vibe when you read his book, but when you read people talk about the relationship with him and his work, you definitely get the guru vibe. But all throughout the pedagogy of the oppressed, and I think we'll hear that as I kind of go through that book, you get this thing where it's like basically Freire is laying down the groundwork for why nothing that he's saying can ever be applied correctly, and you always have to go back to the source. This is what Martha Nussbaum, a feminist critic of Judith Butler, uh, but feminist critic in general, but she rips Judith Butler apart in a famous uh, essay called The Politics of Parody. No, that's not it. That's, that's something Judith Butler put out. It's called The Professor of Parody. I think so. Um, and she's she's ruthless to Judith Butler, but she says that Judith Butler exhibits this thing called a guru mechanism and describes it as such. So you can't really ever tell what Judith Butler is talking about. So her students and acolytes have to continually go back to the guru or the source to properly understand what the guru was talking about. Well, Freire is 10 times worse than this. He's advocating basically that everything has to be done in a, you can't reproduce anything. It must actually be done in exactly its living context. And the only way you're ever going to figure out what his ideas are in every possible context is going to be to hire him in and bring him in. So, and he can therefore never be wrong also because you just say you did it wrong, not, not the, the guru. This is straight up like theosophy of education. If you don't know what theosophy is, you should look that up. Um, sophistry with kind of religious backing to it. And so Freire is this guru. And so he's widely credited, Freire is widely credited as being the father of critical pedagogy, which is the turn in education. But what Gottsman is, I think, accurately uh, contending in this book is that no, Giroux is. And Giroux in the 80s brought people back to Freire, who is the cornerstone now. So in some sense, Freire becomes the godfather or the grandfather, however you want to put it, of critical pedagogy, but in fact, despite having written the kind of er text, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and publishing it in 1970, he's not the guy who caused the critical turn to happen. He was brought back in later as the significant cornerstone work afterwards. And so I think that this is a useful historical context contextualization that Gottsman adds here. Uh, but anyway. Additionally, I argue that the critical scholars should read Freire's work with particular attention to his claim and his core contribution to Marxist political theory that the process of education must be at the center of radical movement building. So this is core to critical pedagogy is critical education theorists believe in their heart of hearts that they are the ones responsible for changing society because they're doing a generational warfare that affects children at the cultural level by basically bringing up new little Marxists or people who are more and more and more inclined to accept Marxism as they go. The process of education must be at the center of radical movement building. They would say that I mischaracterized what they mean by that. They would say that education is the process of naming oppression, that's critical education, and bringing it to light, and that if you are going to have a radical movement, that must proceed, but uh, I don't think I was wrong anyway. If we take this claim to be true, I ask, what does it mean for how we develop and situate our work within broader conversations about radical social change? Always bring it back to radical social change and always more jibber jabber, more conversations. In chapter two, I situate the work of Samuel Bowles and Herbert Gintis, and particularly their book, Schooling in Capitalist America, which was published in 1976 within the intellectual and political milieu of an emerging academic left in the 1960s and 1970s. So now we go backwards in time to that new left academic left thing. Marcuse lays out the groundwork, the new left gets violent and crazy, doesn't work out, and they all go into education theory, K through 12 activism, etc. And they all go into the universities and start getting PhDs and start becoming faculty members. And the academic left emerges out of the failure of the the train wreck of the new left. And so these two guys, Bowles and Gintis, publish this book, Schooling in Capitalist America, which you can tell is going to be a nasty critique of how schooling reproduces capitalist patterns published in 1976, and they are, he's holding them up as a uh, emerging, powerful Marxist critique voice in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, academic left transition. Now, remember, don't lose sight of the fact that I'm talking about education in our schools right now and how they became Marxist, and these guys are all super Marxist. 
just to keep that in mind. I argue, he says, that it was Bowles and Gintis' engagement with their radical milieu that facilitated the production and broad dissemination of their scholarship. This type of engagement, I further contend, is necessary for critical scholars in the current historical moment if we are to continue developing meaningful radical educational scholarship. Additionally, I argue that critical scholars must follow the lead of recent scholarship, such as, I don't know if it's Jean or John, Anyan's Radical Possibilities, 2005-14, which is imbued with the tone and scope of Bowles and Gintis' work in the 1970s and engage in political economic analysis of schooling that pushes against capitalism and seeks to foster the building of mass social movements. Remember, this is written in 2016, saying that the goal is to make education engage in political economic analysis of schooling that pushes against capitalism and seeks to foster the building of mass social movements. Marxist. That's all it is. That's all it is. And critical race theory, post structural feminism, etc. just are tools that facilitated its development and facilitate its ability to be done now. How? Through your children through education that these people have colonized. In chapter three, I offer a close read of Michael Apple's work in the 1970s and seek to understand how his thinking about a critical approach to education developed over the course of the decade, ultimately resulting in the publication of his landmark book, Ideology and Curriculum, in 1979. It's a very important book in the critical turn in education. In addition to a close contextual read of Apple's ideas, I also argue for the significance of reading texts alongside the work that led to their production. For example, reading Antonio Gramsci's work alongside Apple's in order to engage in conversation about the nuances and details of the meaning of the core ideas in the field, such as ideology and hegemony. Stop. So Apple, we find out here, was Gramscian. So Antonio Gramsci's ideas are so integral to what Michael was, Michael Apple was doing when he wrote ideological uh, ideology and curriculum in 1979, that the author here, Gottsman, recommends that you read Gramsci, say his prison notebooks, which is like 3,000 pages long, in conjunction with reading ideology and curriculum, so you actually understand where Apple was coming from. So you have to understand Antonio Gramsci. But again, my big point here to just freeze frame is it is undeniable by this point that we have. We have Freire, a Marxist educator, that's getting invoked. This guy's calling himself a Marxist. He's situated in the critical Marxist tradition, which is a derivation of the older Marxist tradition, a change of it uh, in the Western context. Um, we have Bowles and Gintis are Marxists who are analyzing capitalism in schooling and to see how uh, schooling reproduces capitalism. This is all the encroachment, the vigorous encroachment of Marxism into education. It needs to be understood as such and as nothing else. Absolutely nothing else. All the way down to the critical race theory and the sex education, et cetera, that are tucked into, say, social emotional learning today. This is all just Marxism through education. That's all this is. Every single person. This is what you must understand has happened. The critical turn in education has occurred. The author says so. In fact, he says it's so complete at the beginning of this introduction that he's worried that it's just becoming stale. It's so complete that it's just becoming stale. We heard that same concern from Michael Apple in the other introduction to this book in the previous episode of the series. All this is is the bringing in of Marxism into education. And it's been so successful that they're afraid that it's become stale by the time this is being written in 2016. Critical race theory, comprehensive sex education, everything being done within the critical context of the schools is Marxism being brought into education. And it should be a five alarm, no, maybe like a 59 alarm fire for everybody who cares about America, everybody who cares about the West, everybody who cares about not being in a communist shithole real soon to start getting this crap out of education as fast as possible everywhere it appears. That word critical has become such a red flag. You have to look for it everywhere. Other words like transformative, diversity, equity, inclusion, buzzwords that they use culturally, responsive, culturally, sustaining culturally, anything, ethnic studies, etc., social emotional learning are all connected to this. But it's all just how do you bring Marxism into education to indoctrinate the next generation? And then they can then in, in reflexive turn, indoctrinate the next generation further. And again, I've said before, it's not really indoctrination, it's programming. Program them further, 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 further. Incrementally prep the operational field called your children as they grow up to become Marxist so that when the Marxist revolution is sprung, which they're attempting it now, but if it fails, they'll attempt it again later, 
the population is primed to accept it. And that's why you see this massive acceptance in the millennial generation and even in to a degree the Zoomers for communism and socialism that's unprecedented in American history. They've prepared the ground well. I think I said in the previous episode of this, and I say certainly in my, my forthcoming book, Race Marxism, about critical race theory, that critical pedagogy is like the plow, the planter, and the ammonium nitrate, which is a fertilizer uh, that enabled this Marxist turn to be, or Marxist revolution to be attempted in the United States and throughout the West. So further, he says, I argue for a renewed focus on Apple's core framing of a critical educational project, examining the dominate, dominant and alienating practices of schooling with the explicit intention of changing such practices. So we're going to remake schools to make them even more Marxist in line with uh, Apple's framing, which is based in Gramsci's work, and we're going to end up with a communist nightmare. In chapter four, he says, I argue that critical pedagogy emerged as a specific post-Marxist project in the work of Henry Giroux in the late 1970s and 1980s. Telling you Henry Giroux is the single most problematic figure in all of this. You must understand how important Henry Giroux is to having ruined the United States and Canada Um, and through education. He's the one who brought Freire into our, our frame. He is a relentless activist. He worked diligently and was very proud of it to uh, early in his career to get 100 tenured critical theorists uh, as educa- in, in, in colleges of education as a beginning first step to affect the critical turn in education. This guy has been a relentless uh, terror in educational theory, and he's got copious videos of himself all through YouTube. You really should look this guy up if you've never heard of him. Henry Giroux, G-I-R-O-U-X. This argument, he tells us, counters the dominant narrative, also discussed in chapter one, which centers Paulo Freire in the emergence of critical pedagogy. In recognition of the specificity of Giroux's project, I argue that critical scholars should proceed carefully and judiciously in using the term critical pedagogy as a descriptor of their work. In chapter five, I focus on the emergence in the field in the late 1980s and 1990s of feminist ideas about situated knowledge and standpoint epistemology that coincided with a broader turn in feminist thought toward postmodernism and poststructuralism. Now we're going to understand how things started to get woke and the role the feminists played in doing that, and partly by bringing postmodernism in to bear on all of this critical stuff and turning it into this hot, woke mess that we have today. I focus particularly, he tells us, on Elizabeth Ellsworth's 1989 critique of critical pedagogy's conception of the teacher as intellectual and debate in the debate that ensued, as well as Kathleen Weiler's 1991, I think it's Weiler, W E I L E R, uh, 1991 critique of Paulo Freire and Patty Lather's analysis of research methodology, methodology in her 1991 book, Getting Smart. I argue that feminist ideas about situated knowledge and standpoint epistemology, which were pushed into the field because of an engagement with postmodernist and poststructuralist feminist thought, are particularly powerful at illuminating the problems and possibilities of the role of the teacher and researcher in movements for social change. So they always want to problematize that. This is part of why you end up with this, also going back to Freire, though, and Giroux, why you have this, you know students as teacher kind of concept, you know, student-led teaching that the students are going to pick the curriculum, the students are going to do everything because we're going to, we're going to problematize the knowledge, the idea of a teacher as the intellectual. We're going to problematize the idea that there's a power dynamic um, built into the idea that the teacher gets to tell the kids what to do. An adult telling children what to do is apparently problematic. And, you know, this is important for movements and social change. But we're also seeing the incorporation of standpoint epistemology, which became intersectional positionality later as it developed as critical race theory came in and intersectionality swept through post-structural feminism. How did postmodern and post-structuralist feminist thought get brought in? Well, the black feminists certainly were very engaged with it. Uh, And I mentioned bell hooks earlier. Bell hooks definitely you know, was talking about Derrida and Foucault and the other postmodern post-structuralist ideas. Giroux also cites, in addition to Gramsci, Lenin, Mao, uh, except, well, I don't know if he cites Mao, I'd have to remember that, but he certainly, he certain Giroux certainly cites, just to be very, very clear, certainly cites Marcuse. He certainly cites Derrida. He certainly um, is blending, therefore, uh, Neo-Marxism and postmodernism. He cites Horkheimer. 
he he cites Marx. Um, so this, I think, if I'm not mistaken, actually, at some point later, it talks about people like Judith Butler, but I can't recall. That would be in like his 2011 book, not in his obviously 1980 book. Um, so there's or 81 or whatever. So there's there's this blending of these ideas happening here by the late 1980s and early 1990s. This is exactly the kind of story we were trying to communicate in cynical theories from the angle of postmodernism as central. In chapter six, I examine the emergence of critical theories of race in the field from foundational work in multicultural education in the 1970s up through the landscape of contemporary, contemporary critical race scholarship. In the process, I'll also highlight tensions between critical race perspectives with a focus on the emergence of critical race theory, CRT, in the field in the second half of the 1990s. In particular, I offer a detailed juxtaposition of the CRT approach of Gloria Ladson Billings and William Tate. That's their 1995 paper, Critical Turn in Education. No, sorry, Toward a Critical Race Theory of Education. Totally got mixed up there. Uh, with the CRT approach of Daniel Solarsano and Tara Yasso. Solarsano and Yasso, um, I don't know much off the hand about Yasso, actually, but I know a bit about Daniel Solarsano because he definitely appears in the handbook of critical race theory and education. And he's the one that I keep referring to as um, being very, very strange. He writes this very strange chapter that's like pretending he's having a series of letter exchanges with Derek Bell, some of which he says are real and some of which are not. Uh, and it's just kind of like made up. And he's explaining to him at one point about math education, having social justice brought into it. And this is the XY coordinate plane example I frequently give where he highlights the idea that, that to teach algebra rather than teaching function relations uh, between a dependent and independent variable, the F, XY coordinate plane and functions. Instead, it's, you know, commitment to racial justice and commitment or racial literacy or whatever and commitment to social justice as the axes. And he just turned the entire discussion into a social justice discussion instead of a uh, or critical race discussion instead of into a... Uh, algebra lesson. And so the very practical, terrible nonsense, but they like to say that everybody's intention. So they can say that there's no such one thing that you can actually just nail down and criticize as long as everything's in intention and they never define anything. Remember, we're not defining what a critical education is or a critical theory is. Uh, he already said that and then they, you, you can't nail jello to the wall that way. And so He's going to talk about the tensions and blah, blah, blah. But he says, as critical approaches to race in the field of education continue to develop, I argue that it is crucial for critical race scholars, CRT and otherwise, to think through the nuanced similarities and differences in their scholarship. So just more uh, nonsense text upon text upon text. But that's the six chapters of this book. So you hear the Marxist critiques, the relevance of Freire, who's a huge giant, then actual straight American Marxist critiques. Then the introduction of um, the European theorists more broadly and the revisitation of Freire in the actual American context through Henry Giroux, then the post-structural feminists coming in, and then the critical race theorists coming in. Um, and there's a bit of short shrift here in this uh, summary given to Giroux, who is by far, I think, the most influential figure in this regard. He says, there are other ideas to focus on and certainly other ways to frame this text. A range of scholars merit close historical examination. As with any book, one has to make choices. And so this is sort of a boring, uh, sort of a boring paragraph. Major scholars whose relative absence might be objectionable include, uh, again, I don't know if it's Jean or John Anion, who, while present in every chapter, is deserving of much more sustained attention. C.A. Bowers, who is one of the strongest critics of the critical term, but is also a foundational figure in eco-pedagogical approaches that many contemporary critical education scholars draw upon. Peter McLaren, you should look him up. Peter McLaren, a major figure in critical pedagogy who appears in the book, but as in the case with Anion, perhaps not nearly as often as some might feel is warranted. Thomas Popkowitz, one of the first scholars in the field to turn to the ideas of Michel Foucault. So there's where you're having your postmodernism coming in and post-structuralism more generally, who is basically absent from this book, which may mean that there's at least one counter history to be written and a range of other older and more contemporary scholars working at both the margin and center of critical education studies. I apologize for those absences. Um, Contribution to conversations. The historical analysis offered in this. So before we, we go into this section, I just want to make real clear. 
So far, we have now laid out how the critical turn in education went. And I just want to make that very clear. Education was broadly classically liberal. The academic left emerged out of the new left, started to colonize educational circles. Through the 1970s, you have a swath of Marxist critiques of education and its role of reproducing capitalist hegemony uh, being written. Um, and those eventually lead Giroux to do a lot of his very activist work, again, citing figures like Gramsci, Marcusa, uh, Derrida. Uh, I can't remember how much he cites Foucault, Horkheimer. So all the kind of the big players in this kind of woke mishmash uh, predecessor stuff. And then um, through that activism, the schools actually got the schools of education and and the entire educational space started to get actually captured by Marxists. The Marxists themselves got bent by post-structuralist feminism because it problematized them for being uh, too narrow in the way that they think about things by not being a post-structural feminist. That opened the door to black feminists who are also post-structuralist feminists with racial justice advocacy, as they call it. In other words, black liberation ideas mixed in that opened the door to critical race theory and that bent education the rest of the way. And we're talking by 2000 to 2005 education. So 20 years ago, 15 to 20 years ago at the 15 at the, at the, at the least years ago, education had already been bent entirely to the critical turn. And this is where you start seeing projects like you know, no child left behind, then common core and all of these kinds of different ideas getting worked in comprehensive sex education, eventually social and emotional, social, emotional learning and so on. So you can see how the critical turn in education happened. You can see that once they had things by the balls, by the incorporation of critical theories of race and Marxist takeover of the education schools, that they went kind of full blast and started implementing a generational project that has now had a generation and has come to fruit and has created the catastrophe we see in schools and in our young people today. So there's your explanation for a lot of the millennial generation and the Zoomers and their educational circumstances. Contribution to Conversations the historical analysis offered in this book is a unique contribution to the field. This is standard academic self-justification, by the way. Numerous articles and books make claims about the history of educational scholarship. Michael Apple won, somebody Davies, uh, Ladwig, Leonardo. That's Zeus Leonardo. That is a very important name you should look up. Um, Zeus Leonardo is quoted in uh, Being White, Being Good by Barbara Applebaum, which is a crazy, crazy whiteness studies book, as saying that, that white people's very... Uh, sense of being depends on white dominance. Uh, he's very active to the, to this day. He's popping up. There are videos of him that have been going viral on Twitter this year for the crazy stuff he's saying. This guy's totally out there in the kind of critical race theory of education. And a couple other people get mentioned. Uh, he says, yet there is minimal scholarship that offers a historical analysis of critical scholarship. And certainly no sustained book length study has been written. So I think he justifies, you know, the point of his book. That is what this is, a historical analysis of critical scholarship at book length. And it's good for that purpose. So when you, especially when you start to understand the ideas behind this, it becomes very useful uh, as a guide to see how uh, the West was threatened if supposing we get out of this so I don't have to say destroyed. Um, and remember again, just to always bring it back to that. These are your children that they're using as tools through this project, critical education theory, aka critical pedagogy. He says, while this book is primarily written as a conversation with critical education scholars, I'm sure you're getting tired of hearing that. I certainly am getting tired of reading those that phrase. It contributes to three additional conversations. First, the book is a, it significantly contributes to our understanding of the history of education as an academic field of study. Since the formal inception of the field in the early 20th century, there have been radical voices, voices that come from the uh, margins of society in order to push against injustice in the social order. The social reconstructionists who have been written about at length are the paradigmatic example. However, as Ellen Longman 2000 reminds us in her History of the Field in Elusive Science, Thorndike won and Dewey lost. So a lot of people point to Dewey in terms of how our education system got as bad as it is. But according to the critical turn people, no, in fact, Dewey lost. He says it is not, it is thus not been until the, the past 25 years that radical voices exerted deep and sustained influence on the field, including regularly publishing in the field's leading journals. That's where they started in the, remember he said they started in the sociology of education and crept in. And I told you this, uh, that that in, in all academic fields, I said this quarter set mushrooms works. It starts criti critiquing the, the sociology and eventually the anthropology around a field, 
creates a parallel set of journals and disciplines, uh, books and articles, and even eventually uh, academic departments that is a critical study of whatever. And when they get enough academic clout underneath them, they start to colonize and take over the actual departments themselves. That's how they do. Uh, by starting to replace, they end up, you know, a lot of times a critical education scholar is going to end up in a critical, or sorry, in an education department. And then what they're going to do is slowly colonize the department until they can start pushing everybody else and making the entire department a critical education department. And it starts by saying the sociology around the field and the history and anthropology of the field are uh, totally whack. It need to be rethought thought of entirely. So they start with criticizing the people. Then they move to saying that the people got informed by the subject itself and the subject was infect, infected with their biases. So now we have to rethink the subject itself and they are the only ones positioned to do it. And so they start by criticizing the sociology around a field and its, uh, its anthropology. In other words, it's historical sociology. And then they work their way in, colonize departments, take over and turn the entire department as they have with education into a critical pedagogy or critical studies of whatever uh, field it is. This is the process. So it has n thus not been until the past 25 years that Radical Voices exerted deep and sustained influence on the field, including regularly publishing in the field's leading journals, holding office in the field's main professional organizations, and playing a prominent role in conversations at the Center of Educational Research and Policy. So he's 25 years earlier than that would have been 1991 from when this book was written. So he's saying it took from roughly 1970 or late 1960s up until 1991 before they were able to start really colonizing the full professional apparatus of education. And then from there forward, they were able to do so. So that's how that's so 1991, I guess, becomes this bookmark of when they definitely had taken over. I said 1980 earlier. The 80s were really when the takeover was occurring as opposed to 70s laid the groundwork. The 80s were the takeover by 91, according to Gottsman. Education theory had been handed over in earnest to the uh, critical Marxists. Don't forget who we're talking about here. The Marxists had taken over education. It says, unfortunately, as I've described elsewhere in 2009, though Lagerman offers insight into the th history of radical voices in the field in the first part of the 20th century, her text, which remains the only book-length study of the history of educational research, disappoints by offering only a paragraph on the turn to critical scholarship. Just as the social reconstructionists are central to the narrative of the history in the field in its first 50 years, that's education being the field, the critical turn is central to its history, to the history of the field in its second. The story of the critical turn needs to be told. So in broad strokes, what we're seeing then is we have liberal education, classical education, a classical liberal arts education um, that then the social reconstructionists come through and turn into progressive education that then gets turned into critical education. You can see the changes in three stages, but he's talking about a hundred year sweep where the progressives, starting at the beginning of the 19th century, reformed, <coughs> reformed education into the uh, progressive nonsense that they did, and then that's the thing that the critical theorists were able to col to colonize. So, if you remember my dis my podcast here on New Discourse podcast about the necessity of theology, and I describe it that the um, what you see by the removal of theology, but it doesn't have to be that you know a, a, a religious theology. Theology I characterize as an organized, mature, organized science of meaning organized body of knowledge about meaning and the relationship between fields of knowledge, like uh, knowledge itself being uh, values and social uh, sociology. Uh, I said, what happens is that you have these kind of progressive reformers come in and it's like putting in a, it's like restricting the blood flow. And then the critical people come in and that's like gangrene. The Marxists come in and, and grow gangrenous, gangrenous in that space of um, weakness created by the progressive reformers turning something crappy. Uh, and so you can turn to that podcast to hear that argument far better than I just did it. But he says the story of the critical turn needs to be told. And obviously that's what this book is for. It says second, this, uh, the book is in conversation with work on radical thought in the academy since the new left. I do not believe it is mere coincidence that the best history of the emergence of critical scholarship in the field remains Martin uh, Carnoy's chapter in the second volume of Bertel Ullman's and Edward Varanoff's 1984 two-book series, The Left Academy. The series, which offers a state of Marxist scholarship, 
uh, to the in the academy is the f- is one of the first scholarly books to engage in a robust conversation about the role, position, and intellectual history of radical that means Marxist scholarship in the humanities and social sciences. A study of the critical turn in the field of education gives us yet another window into this history by offering a look at a field of study, education, that is almost always absent from the conversation. Then this is actually I think a significant point. Everybody ignores education except when it's a problem you literally can't ignore, which gave a lot of room for this gangrenous fester to start taking place. The individuals, he says, ideas and texts discussed in this book shed significant light on the history of radical ideas in the academy and the general struggle within the academy to engage in radical theory and practice. As should be clear from the beginning of the introduction, part of the argument uh, in this book which is perhaps made most forcefully in chapter two, is that critical scholars must be in conversation with radicals elsewhere in the academy. So you've got to have a whole network of radicals throughout the whole academy trying to change everything all at once. Finally, he says the book is also in conversation with intellectual and political moves in the academy and the field of education that have occurred outside of the United States. The critical turn in education did not only happen in the U.S. Notice the centrality, though. It's the way the Marxists were going to take over America from within. It was part of a broader intellectual turn that occurred in multiple countries, especially in the United Kingdom, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. The whole Anglosphere, really. This book does not focus on this international conversation, but it is present in every chapter. In particular, work in the 1970s in the British New Sociology of Education and in British Cultural Studies has a large presence in the history of critical scholarship in the U.S. At some point, someone needs to write an, intellect, an international narrative of the critical turn. Hopefully this book will aid that project. And so that's the whole introduction to this book. Uh, the very beginning part was really the part that I think you needed to hear, so we'll kind of revisit that in a second in a summary. But I want to read this note that refers, actually I don't have to revisit it, it's that thing where the Neo-Marxists should be characterized as critical Marxists, but they could be called Western Marxists. Why? Because Marxism was failing. European Marxism, we'll call it, was failing. Vulgar Marxism was failing. And Neo-Marxism arose to understand, just like cultural Marxism arose, to understand how Western culture can be subverted to make room for a Marxist revolution. Significant within that would be Gramsci's indication that education needs to be colonized among the other four pillars of society, those being religion, family, uh, media, and law. Education needs to be colonized so that Marx's so-called organic intellectuals could be cultivated through working class intellectual education. In other words, that you're going to generate uh, a Marxist education. This echoes almost exactly, was picked up definitely by Freire, who became central by, like as we heard earlier, by the 1980s in educational thought. Gramsci's present is felt Presence is felt in Michael Apple's work, which Gramsci had been translated by 75. We heard that in this. And so you hear that the Gramsci and cultural Marxist push that later got named or tangentially or relatedly got named is a better way to put it by Rudy Deutschke, the long march through the institutions. The longest march of the marches through the institutions has really been into education. And the reason is because it allows you to manipulate all the others. You colonize education, you can colonize law schools, you can colonize law. You colonize education, you can colonize professionalism, professional credentialism that's going to lead to colonizing media. Uh, family, you can disrupt most readily by actually indoctrinating kids to break away from their parents. And in whether it's out or not yet, when this one comes out, Groomer Schools 3, you can hear my articulation of how, how deeply insidious that is, but it's also in the Groomer Schools 1 episode. Um, religion also strongly depends upon theology. A religion is, in fact, a kind of organized set of practices in a community based upon a theology. And so theology is a deeply academic enterprise. So if you can pollute the academic, the educational sphere of people who are going to become pastors and theologians, you can pollute a religion. And so education becomes kind of central to this project. And so this Gramscian, which is to say uh, Marxist, um, Western Marxist tradition, is central to uh, what's happened. And that took place as the academic left grew out of the new left, which was that critical neo-Marxist program. So do you understand? 
Marxism was failing. Western Marxism as cultural and neo-Marxism emerged. They developed a critical theory. Gottsman says that should be called critical Marxism. Critical Marxism ends up being all the pieces that come together to inform critical pedagogy, which is also known as critical education theory. And it colonizes education from within and the generational push to colonize the institutions and to subvert Western civilization to make it prepared for a Marxist style revolution, which I tell you and warn you again has already begun in earnest. They have sprung the trap. Our greatest hope is the fact that they sprung the trap earlier than they wanted to and under conditions they didn't want, namely under the conditions of Trump having won a presidency and people such as myself and a few others, Christopher Rufo definitely comes to mind, having exposed their theory for what it is where they did not anticipate that. These are not conditions that they thought they were going to have to deal with. So when George Floyd died under the conditions of the pandemic that they were also pushing you were able, they, they were pushed into the active phase of their revolutionary uh, effort before the culture had been fully subverted. Our legal system, parts of our educational system, or at least the underlying educational ethos, have not been completely subverted. There's an alternative media that has not been completely subverted or, or controlled or silenced or censored or pre-censored, as it were, according to Marcuse. Lots of pieces were not on the board in the place they were supposed to be, and the big big difference just to speak kind of politically you can see is that you know we had in canada trudeau and in united states trump and you could compare what it would be like if it were clinton instead who was supposed to march in lockstep with trudeau uh this huge difference that it caused so some form of a miracle happened in that 2016 election that gave everybody derangement because actually we'd all been lit. The reason the Trump derangement is so bad is because we'd all been living in a deranged state where we didn't realize that the frog was getting boiled and that the, the water was actually starting to bubble. And then all of a sudden Trump's appearance on the scene revealed the bubbles and the regime overreacted the, and they sprung their trap too soon. But this is what you must understand has been going on and is going on. So I'll just read the first of these two notes. I don't think, um, we have to dive into the second, there are only two notes. And it's actually about this Western critical Marxism thing. And he says, while many scholars use the term Western Marxism, for example, Anderson's classic 1976 book, Considerations on Western Marxism, to describe 20th, 20th century Marxist thought that emerged outside of the Soviet sphere of influence. And that's the key. That's what critical theory is all about. Neo-Marxism, critical Marxism, whatever name you want to give it, it emerged outside of the Soviet sphere. Uh, so that's why it's called Western Marxism, but also because its goal is to subvert Western civilization, um, because Marxist revolutions weren't taking that even the Hungarian revolution failed and they were not spontaneous for sure. The way that Marx predicted they would be in major industrial centers, London, Berlin, Paris, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, it wasn't happening. So they needed a different Western theory. So he says, um, while many scholars use the term Western Marxism to describe 20th century Marxist thought that emerged outside of the Soviet sphere of influence and often in reaction to it, that is in the West, following Bronner 2002, Goldner 1980, and others, I use the term critical to identify a more specific tradition of Marxist thought. There has been always, there has always been much debate in Marxist literature about how to define currents in Marxist thought and thus, this choice intended for purposes of specificity is certainly debatable. The history of this Marxist tradition is discussed in chapter one. And I don't want to like dive all into chapter one here, but it, the title of chapter one is Revolutionary Moments. Uh, and he does, there's a bunch of stuff um, that he talks about before this. And I don't want to, he's talking about, in fact, uh, Freire in this chapter, but um the, the the second big section in the first chapter of this book is exile and the critical Marxist tradition. So he's talking about how uh, Paulo Freire gets, um, he has a very bad life really due to what's going on in, in Brazil at the time. Uh, but uh, let's see, where does it say it? Um, it says, like many of his contemporaries, in addition to the revolutionary Marxist tradition, Freire also became deeply influenced by the critical Marxist tradition. So there's a big thing here. Emerging in the interwar years, critical Marxism began as a reaction to historical determinism and positivism dominant within first, second international Marxist, Marxism, whose chief theorists, Karl uh, Kautsky, uh, 
Edward Bernstein and Georgi Plekhanov all read and interpreted Marx through Engels' scientific socialist lens, that is, reading Marx's capital through Engels' anti uh, during And second, with the young Soviet state, which grew increasingly authoritarian after Stalin's quick rise to power following the death of Lenin in 1924, central figures in this turn were, so this is who are the critical Marxists, central figures in this turn were, um, George, sorry, this is, uh, the, 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 the turn, let me make sure I have this right, uh, Grew increasingly okay. Central figures in this turn were George Lukacs, Karl Korsch, and Ernst Bloch in the early early 1920s. Antonio Gramsci in the late 1920s and early 1930s. From the 1920s on, Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, Walter Benjamin, Eric Fromm, Herbert Marcuse, and others affiliated with the Institute for Social Research, commonly referred to as the Frankfurt School, which was founded at the University of Frankfurt in Germany in 1923 and went into exile in 1933, first to Geneva then in 1935 to New York City to escape the rise of National Socialism. It was Max Horkheimer who became director of the Institute in 1930, who in, 19, in a 1937 essay titled Traditional and Critical Theory coined the term critical theory. And just to elaborate just a little bit more, though considered connected to a revival of interest in an early Hegelian Marx, it is notable that some of the foundational work in critical Marxist thought was actually written prior to the publication of Marx's Uh, most of Marx's early writings, including the economic and political manuscripts, which were published in 1932. Thus, for some, such as Lukács, whose History and Class Consciousness, published in 1923, is often Lukács being the guy who led the Hungarian Revolution and was made deputy commissar of its educational program in Hungary in a short-lived regime that they had for four months in 1919. History and Class Consciousness, published in 1923, is often said to have anticipated the economic and political philosophical manuscripts. The publication of Marx's early writings clarified long-held beliefs. For all Marxists who took the critical path, in other words, they became critical theorists, the writings revealed an approach that thoroughly critiqued in Marxist terms of scientific dialectical materialism that had become Marxist orthodox- orthodoxy. In these works, Marx posited a historical materialism grounded in humanism, History as a product of human agency, embraced the Kantian philosophical tradition of critique, wrote about alienation, and held a commitment to dialectical thought as a methodological approach to understanding social relations. So in other words, the critical Marxist approach is a return to Marx's earliest writings, which were where he was most heavily influenced by the young Hegelian movement that he was embedded in uh, and was breaking away from to become Karl Marx. And they were his uh, most Hegelian, most dialectical, et cetera. And so it was a turn, in a sense, back to that critical tradition, the critique tradition that you see both in Hegel and preceding him in Kant. Uh, so just to kind of pin that down. But you hear who the... Uh, you without reading a quote, let me just read this other part. Although somewhat underground for many years, the critical tradition em- emerged in force in the 1960s. So Horkheimer, etc. You heard that list of names. That's what I was going to say. Uh, where did they go? I read them again. Here are your critical Marxists. These are the people that I focus on in almost all of my work. Uh, George Lukács, Karl Korsch, Ernest Bloch in the 1920s, early 1920s, Antonio Gramsci in the late 1920s and early 1930s, and then from the 1920s on, Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, Walter Benjamin, Eric Fromm, Herbert Marcuse, and others associated with the Frankfurt School. That's the critical tradition. He says that laid underground for many years, from the 1910s or 20s, uh, the 1920s in particular, the critical tradition didn't emerge in force until the 1960s. That's Marcus or Marcusa. That's why we live in Mar- Marcus's world. That's why I keep saying that. And then he says, in an effort to rex- rescue Marxian critique from the crude orthodoxy still dominant within the Soviet bloc and to develop an insightful theory that illuminated the ideological structure of the social order radicals across the globe who are mobilizing against an expanding capital social order turn to this critical tradition. Freire participated in this reemergence with affiliates of the humanist praxis group in Yugoslavia, the Frankfurt School, particularly Max Horkheimer, Herbert Marcuse, and Eric Fromm, and a range of independent social humanists like Karl Kosick and Lucian Goldman being particularly influential on his thinking. And so what we're seeing then is that the critical turn in education, in other words, is a continuation of what I've heretofore only ever called neo-Marxism. Uh, or critical theory, which he calls critical Marxism, which is truer, it's better to name as true commitments, 
into education theory and all of the people that I've been talking about for the past two years become the central figures so that you can understand how we got to where we are. This neo-Marxist, critical theory, critical Marxist, whatever you want to call it, thought was being deliberately infused starting from the 1970s alongside more traditional Marxist critique uh, that was increasingly informed by Gramsci was being in infused into our education, our educational system, broadly speaking, by starting out by critiquing the sociology of education departments, sociology of education itself, sociology of schools, but also by um, worming its way in bit by bit into an academic apparatus where the new left had failed and was replaced by an academic left. This tells you how this happened. They colonized and through academia, academia dropped this ball so hard, they were not suited to the task before them, which was to keep these Marxist barbarians out of education. And they failed in this. And in having failed in this, the colleges of education turned bit by bit through those mechanisms I just described. Neo-Marxism was introduced then later by the work of the post-structuralist feminists and black feminists both what were the precursors to queer theory and critical race theory were introduced. And critical race theory and queer theory became the right and left hands that are enabling the cultural revolution to be facilitated upon our children to create the kind of new red guard that makes groundwork or lays the groundwork for the cultural revolution that we are now experiencing. So you actually can see that these names, these people are everything. And Paulo Ferreri, who we, we will turn to next, the next section, I'll kind of next episode in this series, I will kind of go through this first chapter, lay out the relevance according to Gottsman of, of Ferreri, and then we'll turn to Ferreri himself and talk about the pedagogy of the oppressed, which I'll probably deal with in four parts because it's got four huge chapters, kind of give you what he's all about there, uh, summarize each of those chapters. But that gives you the overall big picture between Michael Apple's introduction in the previous episode of the series and um, Isaac Gottsman's own introduction in this part of the series, how education got perverted um, into the Marxist mess that it is today. So stay tuned for lots more coming in this series as I can peck through it. I'm still so interested, just to confess, so interested in the other stuff I was dealing with, the theological aspects of Marx, the theological aspects of Marcuse in particular, that I'll probably divert into those. There'll be other little topics that I just strike my fancy and I'll dive into. So you'll have to bear with me. This is going to unfold over time. I hate to tell you, I think it's extremely important, but I'll just be honest, I don't find this particularly interesting. Um, I keep hoping you, my dear listeners, will take up this charge yourselves and relieve me of it because I don't really want to do it. Um, never really wanted to do it. There are lots of you out there who are more competent in education or have more skin in the educational game than I do who could do a better job of this. I'm just trying to lay some groundwork, lay some, some signposts for you so that you can uh, have the right interpretive frame to be able to tear this thing apart. And God bless you for doing it. I encourage it as much as possible. Don't hold back. <laughs>